Hey there, and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz has the evening off. Here's what we're looking at. This red line extension is really a big deal. The CTA and the city say they want to put residents' priorities at the forefront of community development plans. Three years. That's how long the Kennedy Expressway construction will last starting Monday. Find out how the project could affect your commute. After residents plea for park access, Douglas Park will not host two massive festivals. Powerful work at an ex exhibition from war-impacted artists. And directions for the Chicago street grid. WTTW News explains how to navigate the city. And now to our top story tonight. Community-driven development centered around future CTA stations. That's the idea behind a new plan to revitalize Southside neighborhoods that are part of the proposed Red Line extension to 130th Street. While the extension isn't a done deal, transit advocates are confident the project's moving forward. With $350 million for the project in President Joe Biden's latest budget proposal. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg has been looking into what the CTA hopes to do in the areas around those future stations and joins us now. Nick. Well, Brandis, that 5.6 mile extension of the red line down to 130th Street, it's an idea a long time in the making, like a really long time, as far back as the 1950s, it's been under discussion. Now, in recent years, the CTA has been working in earnest to come up with concrete plans for getting it done and to drum up some local and federal funding. Now, part of that process is thinking through not just the stations themselves, but what kind of development could happen in the half mile or so around those stations. One of the big ideas on the list, improving the local housing stock by rehabbing existing property and building on vacant land. That's shown here in orange around the planned 103rd Street station. They're also looking at retail and mixed use buildings and improving public space. It's an idea called equitable transit oriented development or in simpler terms. Affordable homes, uh, grocery stores, community centers, health clinics, uh, public art, and many other wishes and desires driven by community. Next mayor, next to the next mayor. Now, Elevated Chicago helped with that plan, bringing together residents to talk about what they'd want to see around future stations. Requejo says you have to be proactive because development around transit has often focused on well-off or gentrifying communities. Hundreds of thousands of black families have left the city of Chicago. Let's stop that depopulation and that displacement. Let's make sure that we build homes, small businesses, community centers near transit to retain uh, our African-American residents in Chicago. This kind of planning also hasn't always happened on the front end of things. Melvin Thompson with Andaleo Institute was also part of the community development plan, and his group's been working on revitalizing the area around the existing 95th Street Terminal, which he hopes can be a model. Retail in our communities and in those four stations are going to look vastly different um, in terms of community ownership. So seeing African American businesses surrounded by the new development uh, near those stations creates community buy-in and that is sustainable. In addition to economic opportunities, community leaders are also excited about the planned Roseland Community Medical District. That's tied in with the 111th Street Station and aimed at improving access to care and health outcomes for neighbors. But planners say just having good transit access with the extended train line would also improve health and wellness. This will really create opportunities for families to visit one another much more easily. It'll allow high school students to travel into downtown for internships. Even the festivals and the fun activities that happen throughout our summers. Tanya Raby also says it's key to fill vacant land and attract residents to combat population loss without creating unintended consequences. We are doing um, the work to encourage families to come back to the South Side. And also in that, making sure that we're doing the work to support policies that don't encourage that type of displacement that other residents across the city are experiencing. 
And Nick, what are the steps, next steps for the plan? Well, the CTA had been scheduled to present it at this week's meeting of the Chicago Plan Commission. That ended up getting deferred. A spokesperson told us they don't yet have a makeup date. As for the red line extension itself, Congress still has to approve that $350 million in President Biden's proposed budget. The city's also created a TIF district that's expected to fund up to a billion dollars or so of this project, but that still leaves plenty left unfunded and leaders are working hard to figure out where that's going to come from. Okay, lots of work to do there. Nick Blumberg, thank you. Thank you. And now to some, of more, some more of today's top stories. Drivers on DuSable Lakeshore Drive are being rerouted due to the drive being closed in both directions between Balbo and 18th Street. The Office of Emergency Management and Communications tweeted the closure about an hour ago due to police activity in the area. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability confirms it's investigating an officer-involved shooting near 398 East Roosevelt Road, which is right outside the museum campus. Several news outlets report, though, that both Chicago Fire and Police Department say no one was shot, but Chicago Police confirmed that an officer was struck by a vehicle and injured. In the latest round of endorsements for Chicago Mayor, Congressman and former candidate Jesus Chuy Garcia names his pick for the April 4th runoff election. Chicago is a city of strong public schools, thriving neighborhoods, and progressive values. It is through this lens that I see Brandon Johnson as the right choice and why I'm endorsing him for mayor this morning. When making the endorsement, Garcia urged Chicago progressives to unite behind his former rival, Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson. Meanwhile, today, Paul Vallis criticized Johnson's approach to public safety, saying Johnson wants to cut the police budget. And if you haven't had enough already, early voting starts again on Monday. Vote by mail ballots will start hitting mailboxes next week for those who've requested them. More students would have access to attend community colleges in Illinois under Governor Pritzker's proposed budget plan. The proposed 7% increase in community college funding is helping make sure City Colleges continues to achieve our mission. This investment is allowing us to hold the line on tuition. So we're not increasing tuition this year. We haven't increased tuition since 2016. Comes the, rules. the governor spent the week visiting community colleges across the state to sell the plan, stopping at City Colleges of Chicago's Malcolm X College. The proposal calls for the largest increase for community colleges in over two decades, making working class residents eligible for a tuition free degree. It also calls a $100 million investment in the MAP grant, making it the highest in state history. Next time you're watching a movie or TV series, keep an eye out for familiar places in Illinois. The state's film and industry had, or the state's film industry had a record production year in 2022. The Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity says expenditures soared to $691 million. That's $131 million more than the pre-pandemic record in 2019. A few productions you might recognize are HBO's Somebody Somewhere, filmed in Lockport, Illinois, in Will County, which will be returning for its second season, and hit shows like NBC's Chicago Med, Chicago Fire, and Chicago PD series continue to return to the city of Chicago, along with that new FX hit show, The Bear. And that's just a few. The state says the record expenditures generated an estimated $403 million in wages and 15,400 hires. Coming up in the program, a multi-year construction plan is set to hit the Kennedy next week. Its impact on your commute right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation and the support of these donors. If you drive the Kennedy Expressway, get ready to hit the brakes. Starting Monday, a new multi year renovation project is set to mess with your drive time but eventually smooth things out. Joining us to break it all down is John Schumacher, District 1 Bureau Chief of Construction for the Illinois Department of Transportation. John, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me on. So this $150 million project expected over three construction seasons. I think most Chicagoans are familiar with what construction season is. Uh, focuses on rehabbing 36 bridge structures. Uh, what kind of renovations do these bridges need? 
So um, motorists traveling over the bridges can expect uh, current conditions are going to see a lot of potholes in the bridge deck itself. Um, so the repairs is going to be a latex uh, bridge deck overlay project. So that involves uh, taking a water blaster over the top of the deck and it's going to blast off all the loose and delaminated concrete. Um, and then we uh, do some deck patching to make sure we, we fix all the, uh, the pots, parts of the deck that need to be fixed. And then we'll end up doing a latex overlay on top of, of the existing deck. And now it's going to provide a nice uh, smooth surface for the motoring public. It also uh, acts as almost like a water barrier to help prevent water and salt from penetrating into the deck, which is going to extend the life of the decks and anticipate another 25 years. So how might this affect uh, lanes and, uh, you know, delays? What, what, what kind of closures can we expect? So as you mentioned, it's a three-year project. So I, I'm assuming most people are going to be most concerned with what's going on in 2023. Um, that's going to be primarily the inbound direct. Thing the two left lanes um, of the inbound Kennedy starting Monday night. Um, so the motoring public is going to see their first real impacts uh, Tuesday morning. Um, we're going to start at the north end uh, by the Edens Junction. It's going to go all the way through Hubbard's Cave. It'll take approximately five nights, uh, obviously weather dependent, to get the uh, project fully staged. And once it is fully staged, you're going to have the two right lanes will still be available on the Kennedy itself. And then the reversible lanes are going to be set to their inbound configuration. So we will be maintaining four inbound lanes uh, throughout this calendar year. So uh, for the, oops, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. I was just going to reiterate something that you mentioned because you broke up a little bit. Inbound, two left lanes uh, from, the, uh, from the Edens Junction all the way down to Hubbard's Cave uh, to begin. Um, you, are, you all are also uh, planning work on the reversible lane access control. I think most of us know that as the express lanes. Uh, what's the work that's being done there? So that's the second, that's, uh, the second part of this first, uh, the first project. So we'll be doing the deck repairs as well. Um, and then we'll also be replacing the access control system, which are those gates and uh, all the slip ramps and the entrances and exits to uh, the reversible lanes, which control traffic and, and dictate which way they're flowing. Um, so those were originally constructed in the 1970s and that technology they're still using the same technology today um, so by upgrading to modern day technology it's going to allow the department um, a much easier and more efficient way to both operate and maintain them and, and you said 1970s uh for the the, re the express lanes the reversibles uh when was the last Correct. update for some of the bridges that you're also working on so yeah, the, the bridges themselves are over uh, 50 years old and the last major rehabilitation was in the early 90s. So we're, uh, we're going on 31 years since the, uh, the last major rehabilitation. Um, so the, the bridge decks have performed excellently, um, but they're just in time uh, for that next major rehabilitation. What other kind of updates are, are you all making? I understand there's some uh, lighting, painting, signage work being done as well. Correct. So since we have the lanes closed, uh, instead of, you know, stringing out all these different projects, we're going to make sure we're getting and get all the work done at the same time. Um, so we'll also be doing some pavement patching. Um, and then we'll also be replacing the overhead sign structures throughout the corridor, um, updating the lighting to new LED lights, and then also painting the structural steel that makes up Hubbard's Cave. And when does the outbound work start, John? So that's going to be the third year. So that's going to be 2025. And that'll be a very similar uh, time frame as where we have for 2023, where we'll start the left lanes first. And then uh, approximately late July, we'll switch traffic and the, uh, then we'll close the, the right outside lanes in, in 2025. John, what's your advice to drivers, you know, tackling this, this new commute? So we're asking drivers to obviously uh, be patient and be flexible. Um, as, as one can imagine, there, there should be, uh, there's going to be some pretty substantial uh, travel impacts. Um, whether uh, public transportation is an option for people, that would be a nice alternative. Um, obviously, there's, there's numerous uh, roadway alternatives, such as Elston and Milwaukee, um, that we expect people to take. We also would expect um, some commuters to travel in on the Eisenhower that would normally take the Kennedy in. Um, also, in, in addition to just potential alternate routes or modes of transportation, um, we're also recommending people look into per perhaps staggering their work hours. So instead of, you know, traveling in at eight in the morning, if they can come in a couple hours earlier or a couple hours later, um, that might also help minimize their travel impacts, as would uh, remote work options if, if that is available to people. So 
all the options uh, working together uh, will help minimize the impacts to the traveling public. Um, John, any anticipated setbacks? You know, some motorists might be kind of weary of transportation projects uh, taking a lot longer and costing a lot more than originally projected. Are there any challenges that you might foresee? Um, with this type of project, because it's a rehabilitation project, our, the unknowns are a little bit more you know, certain. We kind of know what we're getting ourselves into. Um, I know a lot of people think back to the Jane Bird Interchange project and how that took uh, quite a bit longer than we originally anticipated. Um, anytime you're going to start a reconstruction project where you're digging into the ground, you're going to find utilities that might not be in the same spots you thought, um, soil conditions that might be worse than you had anticipated. Um, with the rehabilitation project, you're really, um, the scope is much narrower, so there's not as many unknowns. So we're, we're pretty confident in the three year time frame. Okay, three year time frame. <laughs> Drivers on the north side, get ready. Uh, John Schumacher, thank you so much for joining us. All right, thanks for having me. Up next, Patty Wetley with This Week in Nature. Stay with us. It's a big win for some Douglas Park neighbors. Two massive summer music fests will be moving locations. And you might see some green fish in nearby rivers, but the still greenish Chicago River is not to blame. Want to be clear, no blame on the Chicago River. WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with more on those stories as part of her This Week in Nature column. Welcome back, Patty. So hey. catch us up to speed on the situation in Douglas Park. Right, for folks, as a reminder, there were three major music fests there last summer, and neighbors say it creates so much chaos, they lose access to their community green space for almost half the, the summer. Um, they're worried that ambulances can't get into neighborhood hospitals. Uh, they complained so persistently to the Chicago Park District Board of Commissioners that the board amended its code so that these fests would require commissioners' approval. Well, a couple of festival organizers sort of blinked in this game of chicken and they moved. Uh, the Heat Wave Music Fest is moving to Northerly Island. A Lyrical Lemonade Summer Smash is moving to Seat Geek. A stadium in Bridgeview so that only leaves like Riot Fest kind of up in the air so Douglas Park could see a fest free summer which great for neighbors waiting out to see what Douglas what uh, Riot Fest yes. comes up with yes. um, but it's not just residents around Douglas Park that are dealing with this uh, why are other residents souring on these massive events well you have the folks who live around Grant Park and there are neighbors and people who live around Grant Park and they've already been disappointed with what's gone on with Lollapalooza now you have the, the NASCAR race coming and the issue isn't just these events for one day two days three days it's the week long sometimes multi week long setup and down that goes on and this is something that I think the the next mayor is going to have to wrestle with you know what is the role of parks and green space and people are sort of you know the bloom off the rose with some of these major events set up tear down and also the damage that's left behind for some yes, of them. yes exactly so a little bit of st. Patty's Day oh fun. yes see what I did there a green <laughs> fish Thank you. why is the fish green patty because uh, it's that time of year <laughs> for <laughs> the males and females to get together and male bowfin fish, which are native to the Great Lakes area, um, they have green fins and green bellies when it's, you know, time for them to do their job. Meet the ladyfish. <laughs> Meet the ladyfish, <laughs> yes. So just a little fun fact, a little fun green fact for St. Patrick's fish. Day. They are not doing it for St. Patrick's Day. But they are no, doing it so that they can They're doing it to catch the ladies' eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patty Wetley, thanks so much. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read more of Patty's This Week in Nature column on our website, wttw.com slash news. Up next, powerful work by artists impacted by war. This month marks the 20th anniversary of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq. Now, the veteran art movement is partnering with UIC and three arts institutions to bring veterans together to reflect on this anniversary with work created by war-impacted artists. Arts correspondent Angel Ido has the story. Veterans from across the country are gathering to experience art by war-impacted artists and share stories from their time serving. 
The visual arts have, for my, in my personal experience have been a, a, um, a lifesaver uh, in that, you know, it's given me this outlet, it's connected me to this community, which is so important to hear from and connect to and relate to. One of those featured artists is Eric Perez, who served in the early 2000s. His piece at the High Park Art Center features portraits he took of veterans that he served with. Portraits are cut out in digital camouflage patterns. The first layer, which is the layer closest to the wall, is composed of photographs I took of them during the war. The second layer is a layer of, I asked them for images of things that are important to them, things that keep them resilient, things that keep them going and surviving. The top layer is a new portrait I took of them in the last year for this project. For me, visual art can say something in one frame that, you know, people take entire books to write. At the Chicago Cultural Center stands a quilt documenting the black veteran experience. It honors Colonel Charles Young, the third African American to graduate from West Point. He was uh, allowed to go into West Point where he experienced quite a bit of racism while he was there. But in spite of that, he survived and he came out and he became the first African-American colonel in the country. And last year, 2022, they finally promoted him from colonel to general, even though he passed in 1922. It was created by social justice artist Dorothy Burge. Three of her brothers have gone to war. I've been using my quilting as a tool to document African-American history and to uh, get people to do something about issues that are impacting us. My oldest brother was in Vietnam and experienced quite a bit of racism while he was in Vietnam. Uh, the second brother was in Germany and the third brother uh, served here in the United States. All three of them had very different experiences. To hear them talk about their experiences is really powerful. And I wanna document kind of what what happened to them while they were in the service. Whether it's quilts, photographs, or sculptures, Perez says the connector will always be the stories shared through their work. What I hope people get from this triennial is the, the greater history of veteran art and veteran voices. We're not this monolith of veteran thought. We're not this monolith of ideas. We are complex. We're conflicted. I'm just one of the many voices in the veteran chorus. The last thing I want is to make veteran art that only speaks to veterans. I think tethering and, and finding ways of communicating our experiences and relating those to, to others is how we're going to be able to move forward. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. This year's summit kicked off Thursday and runs through Sunday. Visit our website for more information on how you can visit each of the three partnering museums. It's one of those Chicago things where if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, well, you might get lost. I'm talking about the city's grid system and how it works to help you navigate Chicago. Hopefully, this installment of our digital series, WTTW News Explains, will help point you in the right direction. Here's Paris Schutz. Okay, class, are you ready to learn Chicago's grid system? Remember graph paper for middle school math? Well, then you can imagine the Chicago grid. It has a north-south axis and an east-west axis, and the center point is at State and Madison in the heart of the loop. That's zero north, south, east, and west. Each street address contains a directional prefix, N, S, E, or W. A mile is roughly eight city blocks. So say you walk eight blocks north from Madison on State, you'll be at 800 North State. Eight blocks west of State on Madison, that's right, you're at 800 West Madison. Head eight blocks east of State on Madison. Oops, I hope you can swim. Now, let's find some iconic Chicago locations. Wrigley Field is located at 1060 West Addison at the intersection of Addison and Clark. Addison is 3600 North or 36 blocks north of Madison. The 1060 West tells us the address is between 10 and 11 blocks west of State Street on Addison. That is, if State went that far north. 
Now, let's visit Guaranteed Rate Field, home of the Chicago White Sox, at 333 West 35th Street. 35th Street is 35 blocks south of Madison. The 333 means it's just over three blocks west of State Street. So the Cubs and Sox play about the same distance from city center on opposite sides of town. Who can we thank for such a practical, math-oriented plan? A private citizen from Rogers Park named Edward Brennan. He proposed the idea in 1901 to clean up what had been a confusing and chaotic system with repeated street names and addresses that were, well, all over the map. Before we go, let's navigate to one more location, 5400 North St. Louis Avenue. That's exactly 54 blocks north of Madison at St. Louis Avenue, which is 3500 or 35 blocks west of state and home to our beloved WTTW studio. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule. Some addresses fall outside the grid structure, just like some hot dogs have ketchup. Yeah. But we'll save that lesson for another day. And there you have it. Hopefully that sets you up for your weekend plans in the city. And that is our show for this Friday night. For all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services. Where have we been? Where are we at? Where are we going? Essentially to be able to help anyone and everyone in the community, whether that's through academic support, social emotional learning, or just providing a safe space for youth to be able to be there. This is the fabric of the neighborhood. You need to take care of the neighborhood. It's an ecosystem. What should the city be doing to better support black Chicagoans who are victims and survivors of hate crimes? classic city of Chicago, we work in silos, so the left hand doesn't know what the right hand doing, and the constituents get left out in between. Power is the voice. The power is the numbers. The power are the people. The ability to sway election is the power.